Arts and Cultural Heritage funding for the production of Remembering the Vietnam War was provided by a vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4, 2008. The voices of our veterans remembering the Vietnam War. This is Rebel 6, request jump stop. Test stop, over. He said, you're the first one to be shot. And that was quite an impression on me. Type of injury is brilliant, shrapnel wound. When one of the one two twos blew up, you could put a Jeep in the hole and not see the top of it. They will identify with smoke. I honestly uh, was scared for a year. The area is insecure. I counted the days until I could get out of there. Yankee uniform. One, four, four. You never get your soul back. Born in uh, 1949 and uh, in Duluth. I grew up, uh, lived on Raleigh Street for a while, then my dad bought a place outside of Proctor where I eventually went to school. The 60s was great for me. Yeah, I graduated after graduation. It was I was having a ball. Well, I got a school deferment, and I went to uh, St. Cloud State, and I I worked at it, but not as hard as I should have. Uh, I discovered beer, and I discovered that there was an incredible amount of good-looking girls in my age group. And between the two of those, it took away from my study time. So I wasn't doing the best in school, and I was just wasting my time. I was really too immature. It only lasted a year. I went into secondary education. That's what I was gonna major in. And uh, after that, I didn't have a high enough grade, so I got my draft notice, and when I got my draft notice, I didn't want to go to Vietnam, so I enlisted, not knowing I was going there anyway. <laughs> By then I was uh, dating my wife, my to-be wife, and uh, I was flipping hamburgers at Henry's Hamburgers, and uh, I thought, there's got to be some more to life than this, and uh, so I saw the Marine Corps uh, uh, drill team on television, they had their dress whites on. And uh, I thought, boy, that's really sharp. I, I love their uniform. So I got up and went down to the Marine Corps recruiting office and joined for two years. Met two of my neighbor buddies. They were both home on leave from the Marine Corps. They were both in Vietnam, both home on leave together, their brothers. And I got to talk to them. And I was kind of excited about what they were doing. And I, since I didn't have a direction as far as what I wanted to major in at college, I thought, well, maybe it'd be a good idea to go enlist in the Marine Corps for a two-year enlistment and get my GI Bill and go back to school. So I did that. I went uh, enlisted in September of 1969, and I went active in uh, actually um, uh, January of 1970. I did my basic at Fort Campbell, Kentucky. And all in all, basic was great. I had no problems with it. Um, to be honest with you, they couldn't dish out enough stuff for me. I loved it. And the reason I say that was a, I was a pretty physically fit teenager at that time. Training was a breeze because I was, uh, uh, we, had, we got wrestling in our school my last year and I took third in state, and uh, we just worked out all the time. Well, I, <laughs> it was the physical, physical part of it. To me, it seemed like I was gonna be in like 10 or 12 weeks in a row having Phi Ed. That, that part of it was just kind of fun. I was, uh, you know, I played college football and was in training, and I, I was in, pretty good shape so it, the physical part of basic training didn't really affect me that much the mental 
training was a little different. I, you know, my parents, I had a nice, strict family, and we had rules we had to follow, but they didn't necessarily yell at me all the time. The training itself wasn't uh, all that difficult. I, I was a boxer. I played judo for several years and, and wrestled and did a lot of individual cross-country sports and that type of thing. So I was in really great shape. The, the mental process was, was scary. It was, uh, it was, it was uh, a lot different than today. It was, it was pretty brutal. My basic training was in Fort Bliss, Texas. We were supposed to go to Fort Ord, but they were full. They had no room for any more troops, so everybody that in Southern California went to Texas. So that was quite an experience there. And after the boot camp was done, we went to Pendleton for our individual training with the big guns, uh, bazookas and the machine guns and M16 and so on and so forth. And after that, I got, uh, I was assigned as a field radio operator. MOS was 2531. Uh, field radio operator, which is actually a glorified grunt. You carry a radio with you when you're in, in Vietnam. And I went to radio school back at MCR, MCRD in San Diego. We received our, our, uh, our orders for what our MOS, military occupational specialty, was going to be. And he hollered out Danielson, and, and I, responded and he said, you're 2531, field radio operator. I had no idea what that was at the time. He said, you're the first one to be shot. And that was quite an impression on me. My MOS was, I was a crypto computer repairman. And we fixed the machines that would uh, turn uh, typewritten messages into uh, cipher. And you know, I, I, if I'm going to communicate with you, I would I, I would type it out, and we'd feed it into our machine, and it would come out of the, these crypto machines as a real garbled mess. When you would get it, you'd get that garbled mess. Your machine would then turn it back into uh, print, so that we could get the message. Well, coming out of, uh, out of boot camp, you receive your MOS, which is your mil military occupation specialty. And mine was a machine gunner. And, uh, uh, and uh, I remember calling my dad on the phone and saying, Dad, I just, got a, I just got my MOS, and I'm a machine gunner. And he says, well, why are you so happy about that? And I says, well, you don't have to walk point. You're always like seven or eight guys back in the, in the line. So, because so many point men got shot right off the bat. So, but uh, he, he kind of grumbled something like, I didn't know what I was talking about, which I didn't. And, and uh, so then uh, went through, uh, uh, after boot camp, through, uh, went through what they call infantry training, uh, several weeks of infantry training, then machine gun school, and then staging, uh, getting ready to go to Vietnam, and then uh, off to Vietnam. And then after they said, told us you're going to Vietnam, and. Uh, I didn't go get a map and look where it was. I just knew it was someplace in the Far East. So that was it. I got on the boat, and, and uh, the wife asked me, how was that for you, getting on the boat? I says, I didn't know no better. I says, and I hopped on the boat like, I'm going to the Far East, get this big donkey moving. <laughs> It, it was just what could crazy. There was 15,000 troops landing in with the 12 ships, and it was just a chaos of dust, trucks, people, and um, um, it was awful. What could confusing about about getting to what a place where you could sleep and food, rations. It was a chaos, but it was just the way it was. <laughs> to me, it was just another part of life because I grew up in the Army, and, and, and I never had a job before the Army. So I just took everything as just, just, just the way it is. And we got off the 
the plane and everybody was just looking around trying to figure if they'd be dodging bullets and it was just like really quiet for an airport. And they took us uh, about a, two or three blocks away in a, kind of an underground Quonset hut type of thing that was sandbagged up. And, uh, and I can remember the smells. It was, it was just terrible. It was like rotten rotten fecal matter and things like that. It was steaming hot. It was probably 110 or 112 degrees. And just and we had stateside what they call utilities or, and, uh, uh, and not, not the jungle utilities that would dry in, in the air. These were real heavy, thick stuff and everybody was sweating. And, and, uh, and we could look out the, the window and we could see the planes loading and, and, and um, they just kept us there for a couple hours. And, and I watched the, our plane that we just got off with that they were loading the caskets coming back. And it seems like about as many people that got off that plane were hauling uh, coffins back to the United States. You know? So we were, it was a real eye-opener. It stunk. <laughs> I mean, by that, when I, when I got off the, pla off the plane there, the heat hit me right in the doorway, and, and uh, the, the country just smelled like one big cesspool. <laughs> it smelled like heat and death. You know, it's just, yeah, it just the stench that stays with you forever. I knew when I got off the plane at Cameron Bay, it was like 110 or 112 degrees, and, uh, and the stench of that country, that's always embedded in my mind. That and the smell of blood, does those things won't go away. Then after three months, I got orders to Vietnam. And I wasn't expecting that. I figured I was in the Navy. I should be on board a ship. I wasn't going to Vietnam. Well, I did. And I was attached to a swift boat squadron. Uh, I got with a machine gun team that was securing a highway. And it was really pretty much a perimeter. And you uh, checked identification cards and you provided security. Well, I was only there about three weeks. And then my outfit, the 2nd Battalion, 7th Marines, was activated as a battalion landing team. And they took us all out of Vietnam, put us on ships back to the Philippine Islands. We refitted and regrouped and add people to our, our, uh, our roster. And uh, then our job was to go into all the places that where people were being hit real hard. So our, our job was to bail people out, either by helicopter, by Amtrak, or whatever. And uh, so I guess that would be my typical day, was out in the bush. We didn't have a rear area. Most, uh, most Vietnam vets will say, well, I was, in a, I was in camp this, or camp that, or fort this, or fort that. And we were always out in the bush. Normally, about every month or so, that we would come back in on board a ship throw our clothes away and take a shower, maybe the first one in six weeks or a month, and uh, get refitted and, and uh, new ammo and cleaned up. And most of the guys would be full of jungle rot and sores and, and who knows what, uh, 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 worms and everything from drinking the water. And so the average day would be getting up about 4.30 in the morning, unwrapping yourself out of a poncho liner which is a big like a big tarp to keep the mosquitoes off you and uh, never took my boots off you see, you see a lot of times in pictures that guys are sitting around with their boots off is you don't want to be out in the bush and get hit and have not have your boots on and so you you were pretty much dressed the way you were for the day maybe washed your face if you had any water and you'd hear them holler saddle up ultimately i was assigned to the first marine division which turned out to be the 3rd Battalion, 1st Marine, 1st Marine Division, and uh, I was assigned to the h &S Company, which is a support company for uh, the other four line companies, India, Kilo, Lima, and Mike Field company, uh, companies. So uh, my first station there, duty, was um, TAD to the India Company. I did, uh, I went in the field with them as a field radio operator. I set up the command post 
and that was the major part of a field radio operator. And I would get with each squad, and I would go on patrol with them occasionally, uh, set up night ambushes, and be with the, the line companies pretty regular. I was supposed to be a field postal operator. I went to, I went to uh, AIT for that. But anybody that went to NOM was, was their, their first MOS was 11 Bravo, that was infantry. Although we didn't get infantry MOS. Uh, I, stayed in, uh, I stayed in the postal for a couple months and then I started volunteering for different things and, and I ended up a squad leader eventually on a reactionary squad. We had 12 guys in my squad and, and uh, they put us way down by the wire in the compound and just left us alone. So we'd go out at night and, and uh, do our thing and then come back in the morning. We had to hook our uh, crypto machines up to uh, radar that would uh, shoot out the messages uh, and you know, from one station to another, one spot to another. But uh, carrying that machine, the machine weighed about 35 pounds or so, that just put an extra target on you. So, I mean, it, that t to the enemy, you appeared to be a little more important. You know, <laughs> that, that, that was kind of the downside of all of that. And uh, so I, I, I honestly uh, was scared for a year. I counted the days until I could get out of there. And but tiring. I was back to guns, big guns, big artillery guns. The, the bullet that, that came out was this t tall. It had an air timer in it. It had 100 pounds of powder behind it. And uh, I got in back of the guns and I was so tired, so beat out, that I got into a pup tent and the next morning, the guys were laughing at me because I didn't have a pup tent over me. And they told me that night, the guns were going off. Missions. And I was bouncing off the ground. I was so tired, it didn't even bother me no more. <laughs> and the guys thought it was kind of comical that I didn't even wake up. That, that, that's how tired you get. Uh, on the average day, especially when flying the helicopters, would be up in the morning and going, having breakfast, going out and doing numerous missions, hauling troops into a, a landing zone or picking up troops at another landing zone. Uh, and a day would often, there was no beginning or end, it would often run. 10, 12, 14 hours in a day and on calling or flying or crawling under the helicopter to get in some shade. So it was basically just uh, living outside for a year. You know, you're outside for a year, sleeping on the, sleeping on the ground. Uh, and uh, you basically chase the Vietnamese around or the NBA around uh, during the day. And then you dig in, dig a perimeter and dig a foxhole. And you're all, you know, you form a perimeter, try and find some high ground. and form a perimeter and dig foxholes and then you sleep by your foxhole. Uh, and then they try and attack you at night, you know. We camouflage our radios as best we could. Uh, they call them PRC 77s. We would put them in our pack sack and it looked like it was just personal gear. And we had two types of antennas that we used on the radios. Um, one was a whip antenna and one was a tape antenna. A whip antenna extends maybe uh, six, eight feet in the air, and it whips back and forth when you're walking. And when you're in a, on a patrol in the grass, and the grass might be up to your waist or higher, and the enemy can see that whip antenna so they know where the radio man is, so they'll direct the fire there. So what we did was take our, our tape antenna, and it was only about a, maybe a two-foot tape, almost you know, very similar to a, 
a tape that you use to measure. Um, we would screw that in the back of the antenna and we would fold it over and we put it into our shirt so that you couldn't tell it was our antenna. About every third or fourth day we'd run into some, an ambush of some kind or run into the enemy. And uh, that's when being back in the line with, as a machine gunner, most of the time for some reason they didn't figure, uh, the enemy didn't figure out that that if they waited for half of your people to go through the ambush, they could split you in half and do some damage. Normally they shot the first two or three Marines that were there. And, uh, and uh, so then we, they, machine gunners don't do anything until they're told to. So when f the firing starts, you drop, you start snapping on extra ammo. Uh, my gunner would carry maybe 100 rounds attached to the machine gun. I would carry 700 rounds, and that's 49 pounds of ammunition. And uh, uh, we would snap on a couple extra hundred rounds. We would we would take cover and we would lay there. And uh, I remember the first couple of times they said, "Well, what do we do?" And uh, the, the gunners would say, "We don't do anything until they say guns up." And maybe a third of the time they never called for guns up. It would be an ambush of, you know maybe one or two people injured or something like that and, and they didn't they didn't need an assault. So we'd, we'd sit there till they called guns up and then we had probably six gun teams of four guys. So we'd have 24 uh, guys ready to fan out and open up with automatic fire, so. My gunner was he was kind of a crazy hillbilly, and um, he wasn't married, but I had got married by that time. And, and, and he'd kind of kneel up and he'd grab me by the back of the head and try to push me down. And I said, leave me alone. And, and he'd say, you're married, get your head down. <laughs> so we always have a, a running commentary of who should be watching what. Matter of fact, I turned 21 in Vietnam, and Bob Marinucci and some of the other guys were a little bit younger because I was 21 they call me grandpa and to this day they still call me grandpa when I go up there maybe half a dozen of the guys friends that I met through Bob uh, hey grandpa how you doing you know and so I that that nickname still stuck with me from from Vietnam from turning 21 I was the oldest one in my in my platoon uh, the field radio operators are, are 25 31 guys I was the oldest one 21, so. We were on a resupply mission one day on Long Highway 1, which ran north and south through Vietnam. And from our battalion rear area, we had a convoy of approximately six, seven trucks, resupply trucks with uh, uh, men on it. and ammunition and water and sea rats and cases of sea rats and I was driving the Jeep at the time and it's a mobile a mobile Jeep had a radios and along the back of the side of the Jeep and um, as it was north of Da Nang on High Vaughan Pass area we got ambushed um, there was a mortar ambush small arms fighter and I was very lucky during that ambush, one of the enemy mortars landed directly in front of the, my Jeep, uh, blew out the windshield of the Jeep, the dash of the Jeep, and uh, the radiator received some damage. And that was probably the closest I'd come to a direct hit in an ambush. And of course, we'd bail out of the Jeep, and one of the trucks went over the edge of the road and exploded, and not a, nobody got hurt on that truck. They jumped out too and were safe, but from that point on we could see where the enemy was firing at us and uh, we returned fire and that incident is where I, I received my uh, combat action ribbon. I had a lucky day, I don't remember, I don't remember dates or anything hardly over there. In fact, there's a lot of it I don't remember at all, but um, we had a we had a 122 rocket came in and took the last two rows of sandbags off of our bunker 
and then blew up behind us. That was a lucky day. Because when, when one of the one two twos blew up, you could put a Jeep in the hole and not see the top of it. And then after we got a compound out, the, the, the Charlie would book a tunnel underneath our wire and then put like a Yankee go home on the plane that was sitting in a compound. That was scary because they could come in and cut your throat and you wouldn't know it. I got to Vietnam in a, approximately the middle of the month in uh, January 68 and w two weeks later the Tet Offensive took place in, in Vietnam and the Tet Offensive actually started in the city that I was at, it was called Nha Trang, it was uh, like in a central part of Vietnam right on the, right on the ocean and the times for the Viet Cong got mixed up somehow and it was supposed to, I, I don't know exact times, I'm just going to use the example, but the, it, was, it was supposed to start at like six o'clock throughout the country, the Tet Offensive was going to start. Well, it started at four o'clock in the Trang. There was a two hour communications gap with them and it started two hours early in our city and the, the base camp that I was at, we got overrun. We were off of Dung Island and Dung Island was a haven for the Viet Cong. And we had, it was two, two things. It was all kinds of junk floating down this river. And we were worried about mines. Two things, number one, a floating mine that would hit the, hit the ship. And number two, we were worried about a UDT team that would swim underneath and actually put mines on the bottom of the ship. And uh, so we had a, a boat that went around us and it was, it had 30 caliber machine gun on it and it would shoot the stuff floating down the river. And one night they fired a, um, I don't know if it was a mortar or a RPG or whatever from the shore and it lit between our boat and the ship. So they just missed us. I was on the right hand side of the machine gun with my left arm over the barrel of the gun. And as they start sweeping up the hill and the first round that was fired was by their sniper and it went through my shirt and under my armpit and and and, uh, and then the second shot as he tried to finish the job hit in front of me I remember getting splattered in the face with gravel and stuff like that but uh, uh, so that was my, my luckiest day had I been right-handed and been on the other side of the gun it would have been a perfect shot Our veterans' voices continue on the next episode of Remembering the Vietnam War.